Welcome to a fine gaming experience, everyone. It's Bricks or This Way Lies Madness. And Ice. Back here for another one. I'm just going to cut right in. Oh, well, okay then. Well, he's here. I'm here. He's back. Back, yes. I apologize for the last one. Technical difficulties were our bane. We had many technical difficulties there, but... It's all good, I did it solo. And we got our brand new room here to trick out. An interesting thing about that bed, uh, it serves pretty much no purpose. However, in earlier Monster Hunter games, that is where you would go to save the game. That's where your cartridge, in most cases, because most of the Monster Hunters were portable games for a while, would save, or it would save under your memory card. And now, because everything's auto-saves, there's a lot more options. And, as you can see, options, you've got a ton of different things you can do with decorating in here. Now that I actually have space, we can put many animals around instead of just having our cat door run into our roommates. You've done a little bit of fishing, I see there. Indeed, the aquarium is one of my favorite additions for this, too. Partner, let's go on an expedition out in the Great Ravine. I'll tag along. Well, we're not going to do that expedition quite yet. First off, we got some catch-up to do. And I'm going to start that off by talking about all the weaknesses for the monsters we fought so far, because we really haven't done that yet. And our Great Jagras is kind of the default punching bag. I've taken on 23 of them so far. But he's got weird weaknesses. He's immune to water, all the status ailments. He is very weak too. And fire, surprisingly, is the big one. But he's also a prey of Anjanath, as we saw in that one cutscene. Mm -hmm. And if you notice there... He is more armored in the back half. Even though it is still a weak point, it's only two stars. And that is slashing, blunt, and your ranged weapons. And our bird friend here has two areas he'll be in. Very interesting. Kuliaku's hunts are, are unusual because you have to find out where he is and he has very weird patterns. And his weaknesses are weird. Uh, he's more vulnerable to elements in a lot of ways than Great Jagras was, but more average on the status ailments. And his only weak point, really, is the head. You can break his hands there, as you can see, but the head is the real weak point. And the biggest annoying thing about the head is he blocks it with his rocks. Which is very annoying. And not to mention very damaging for your weapon. And good old Puke Puke, haven't fought too many of them yet, but he is just a storm of weak points. His status ailments are kind of interesting because he uses poison, so of course he's not too weak to that, but everything else is fairly effective. I would have thought water would have been a good one to use against him, but... Apparently not. Thunder weapons are actually your best bang for your buck. A lot of your stronger monsters are actually weak against thunder, especially some of the late game ones. That's very true. If you're going against something and you're not sure what to bring, Thunder Elemental is a pretty safe bet. You will notice the icons here too. They're blown up in these pictures so you can sort of see them. This is very much a classic Monster Hunter thing. And it's very hard to figure out what some of the older monsters look like because they're just like symbology, but these ones I find are a lot better designed. You really get an idea of what the monster's all about. Puke with that big tongue. This one I find interesting is that Baroth's head is breakable, but not a weak point. It's so armored that, of course, it's not going to be a real weak point, but his hands and tail are. And the hands are really hard to hit. Very few weapons can hit them perfectly. And if you didn't notice his elemental weaknesses, him and Jury Totus share a similar thing where they will armor up with their mud. And if they're armored up with their mud, they will have one elemental weakness, but once it's off, it switches. Hence that weird brackets going on there underneath the elements. And never use fire. Ever on Jerry Totus. It's a pretty bad idea in general. There's not many things in that area. It's a desert, and not many things would be weak to fire, I would think. 
With a few monsters that are of a lightning element themselves, you want to avoid using any of that on him, but it's pretty rare to see that. I haven't taken on too many of them yet, but one thing I do find interesting here is the tail is a very big weak point. It is breakable, but not uh, severable, like it was saying for some of the other guys. Well, that's actually because he's got some unusual things. If you notice, the weak point of the head is actually much weaker than the tail, because the tail kind of counts as his head in a lot of cases. You can't KO the tail, but it is a severe weak point, and it's kind of almost a third, if not more, of his body. Yeah, that tail is a very big target. One thing I wanted to point out here is you notice the smallest and largest categories. Um, we had a really interesting thing on the Jagras. I'll let you explain Anjanath, and then I'll go back and describe that afterwards, why those matter. Anjanath, as we were mentioning before, the throat is the big weak point, which they kind of just make the head, and the tail, which we can cut off. But his weaknesses are interesting, because he's complete, completely immune to fire, since he uses it so much. And I would have thought Dragon would have been a bigger weakness of his, but surprisingly not. He's actually uh, a good reason to go and farm your Juritotus, because the more Juritotus stuff you get, the better water weapons you get. It gives you a good edge against Anjanath. And I saved this one weird quest just to show it off. It's not something we have to do very often, but we have to go get some eggs. Lots of interesting mechanics only specific to these quests. The thing I was going to mention earlier was that the size of a monster, you can actually get silver and gold crowns, both for the small size and the large size. And that's essentially telling you, hey, you have found the smallest possible variety of this monster that exists and the largest possible variety. In the case of the Jaggers, we had that quest where we had a little tiny sausage shaped miniature Jagras, smaller than an actual just Jagras Jagras, and then we had the jumbo version of him as well. So we actually got a gold crown on both of those, I'm pretty certain. Yeah, that's one thing with the uh, events quests that we'll get a lot, is it's very easy to get some of the silver crowns and whatnot from those. There is a specific event where you'll be fighting all the creatures, pretty much. Uh, it's a set of four in one environment and you get a very high chance that those will be your biggest size. You'll need both hands to carry larger materials. Keep in mind where Let's this nest is. If you're hunting the Kuluyaku, he mind, loves to go to that nest. And this nest Either is kind of lucky because it's money. so close to the box we need to drop everything off at. And these herbivores aren't too happy we took their eggs, so they're going to be hunting us down as we try to run away here. I do love that you can smack them in the teeth with your weapon, and they'll generally just run away and do nothing, but here, they will actually try to murder you. It's like, give me back my baby. Don't turn that into an omelet. It's one of the rare times a herbivore will become very aggressive towards you. Now, you're using the run command here, and that's very important for these quests, but unfortunately, your regeneration is slowed. And once that bar reaches zero, you will actually have a moment where you're very weak and quite slow. And if you get hit, you'll drop the egg, it'll shatter, and that's the end of it. You gotta go start again. And these are herbivores. We'll be doing tougher versions later with carnivores. And you can picture how much fun that is. I'm actually going to say I find some of the herbivore quests a little bit harder than the carnivore quests, except for one specific one, involving one of my favorite monsters. Well, here's the fun thing with the herbivores. They're not too smart. They're not used to hunting after other creatures, and if we give them a little bit of difficulty spotting us, we won't be bugged at all. The Gilly Mantle turns this quest into a little bit of a joke, in a way. And I believe it would last just about long enough to get back to the camp, if not longer. A little bit longer. I don't think I could do two egg runs with it, but you could probably complete most of your second run. One of the great things about these quests, if you've got friends you're doing them with, you can do them in no time at all. One of the options you can do to make these a little bit more safer for yourself 
is kill off any of the creatures that will be aggressive towards you. It might take a little bit longer to kill off these herbivores, and you have to do it in a window before they respawn, but then you have nothing hunting after you at all. Yeah, it didn't even get halfway through my mantle there, so... And we're doing this to get those free stat boosts. It's something I need to mention about those stat boosts. They are incredibly useful for us, because we've actually been doing quite well in the game so far. However, when you die, you lose your food buffs. You get one chance struck off your record, you go back to camp, and you've lost all those buffs. There's a couple items you can use to help fix that. Your own type of meat, if you've grilled some meat, it helps, builds your stamina back up. And ancient potions are another excellent way to boost your stats. There's also nutrients you can take as a lesser alternative. I love the ancient potions, but they require farming those little kelpie guys that we saw running around in the uh, area outside there. Gotta hit them in the head to get their horns to make those potions. A little annoying, and there is something later on we'll get that makes it a little bit more efficient, but still very annoying. However, those ancient potions are very worthwhile. And our cute little bee poogie. That's what we get from the Spring Fest. But we got some other outfits we can find for our poogie pet. You have to take him to certain areas, and I can't get all of them yet because I haven't gone far enough in the game, and I don't have Iceborne installed yet, so... But this giant fossil over here will interest our poogie. Digging in the wood somehow. And oh boy. Yep, the white jammies. There's a ton of fun little customization stuff on Monster Hunter. We can even change the colors on these, but... This is a really cute one. I like this sheep outfit. <laughs> a pig in sheep's clothing. The texturing is a little strange. He kind of looks like some sort of weird slug. Yeah. And Poogies can dig after every quest. I thought at first it was only once per day kind of thing, but as long as they're affectionate towards you which is pretty much just pet them before you pick them up. Get that timing right. Yep. Fail a bunch. I believe they kick you in the face if you fail. If you fail, he will ram you right in the chest and knock you on your ass. As well he should. This is one of my favorite outfits. Just got to take him here to the tree. He'll dig underneath that little flash fly stand. Hog and a frog. It's a great name. I actually have not done much with Pookie. I am unfortunately not one of those collection aspect persons unless it makes me stronger. That is amazing. It's just great. I don't know what else I can say about it. And you can change the colors on it if you really want to have a funky frog. So It's a little nightmare fuel. Because <laughs> it actually looks like he's just living inside of the body of a frog, which is... Weird. I've seen those videos of frogs eating everything and anything. Oh, little sausage. What was going on with your palico there? I had to stop and like, yeah, Loki was just having a little spasm there, but uh, he's getting jealous. We're spending too much time with our pookie. This is important. This is top tier importance. Research Commission is depending on us to make the Poogie cuter. Well, our Huntsman buddy that we were getting quite a bit of assistance from in the last fight with Zora is hiding a little present here beside him. Oh boy. Yep. This is a really great outfit, though. <laughs> uh, why does he have a spatula and a pan? Oh, it's He's got all the utensils and everything there, the little roll. He's even got the goggles on. 
Well, I am thoroughly impressed. And it's sadly the last Poogie outfit we can get at the moment, but... There is still something we can do with the Poogie. It's not very nice. But if we take him up here and drop him off by the stew pot, he freaks the fuck out and <laughs> runs away. <laughs> well, you're going to turn him into a little sausage. If you actually take him behind the counter towards the Meowster chef, he will leap out of your arms and run away. But yeah, he runs right off the map. Wow. Going on expeditions? Well, we're not going to go to the Great Ravine like we're supposed to. We got something special we can do for our Palico buddy here. Aha! Uh -huh. Could have done this one a little while ago, but these things are so important to do. And we're actually tracking down these sort of little paw print hieroglyphics that'll be up on the walls that are called doodles. Now, you can only do this on an expedition and when your doodles are maxed out. And you'll see on your map another palico. But this one is a little freaked out by us and just keeps running away. So we gotta hunt him down. Linear traversal commands, they're gonna be important here. Where did he go? It's weird. He'll do, like, digging at some point, so you have to pay attention to which direction he was moving. But as long as you keep him in eyesight for the most part, it's not too hard. You get a few things out of this, actually. You don't just get new uh, surprises for your friend. You actually get some very useful things for yourself. More doodles. And I would like to point out, now we know that these are the Bug Trapper Doodles. They're not just question mark doodles. Each area has its own group of cat people, basically. Let's ask the head honchos. Always nice to find this camp. It'll become... Oof. I wasn't sure you were going to catch that one. Those vines are a little annoying to miss because that's a big drop. And this is very high up in the tree. We haven't really shown off too much of this area yet, but this is higher up than the one nest we were meeting the uh, Anjanath and other beasties in. Yeah, Toby Kadachi's got a nice high nest. Anjanath and his meetup of the wyvern for a little bit there. Mm -hmm. They're doing some sort of greeting dance. Yep, this is a very weird little bit, but uh, Loki will basically communicate with the other cat people for us. And yeah, he basically is going to join their little tribe. And so do we. And each of them will do their own unique test. He was making sure we knew the paths of this area and whatnot. Most of them will require more steps than this one, and some of them are extremely difficult. In my opinion, the one that's in the Wildspire Wastes is just ridiculous. Well, we're doing that one next. Oh boy. I will, I will complain incessantly about the problems with it. More my problems than anything. But what we got from that was the Flashfly Trap for our Loki. And what you can do now is set down a little cage that has a whole bunch of flash bugs in it. And we can trigger it at any point with an attack. We're just activating it. And it'll blind the opponent temporarily. Very handy. Now I will say, as wonderful as it is, there are some issues with it. Monsters do build up immunity to the Flash, and if you use it too much, they're not really going to be affected by it anymore. The big problem with that is if you're fighting a flying monster, you want to decide when you're going to flash them out of the air. But early on, when you don't have a lot of supplies, it is actually a very, very nice item to have. Especially if you're doing pretty well in the game, and you don't really need the extra healing. But I find the healing is excellent, 
to a point. About halfway through the game, you'll find it less useful. It does get pretty hard to build up a lot of flash resistance early on. And you saw a mark on the map there for Grimmelkinds. That is the name of these right here. Oh, almost. There we oh, go. Oh. Yeah. The cactors are worth catching just because they're worth so much resource points. And they look great in our room. <sighs> they do. Still terrifying. Speaking of terrifying, jump down this pit into a pile of corpses and lose my connection in the process. Eh, no worries, it happens. The internet has not been our friend lately. Surprisingly not. All these uh, other people using it right now, I guess. Of course, I'm getting a little twitchy not seeing you get those bone piles, but I understand. We're on a mission. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to do those in my own time when I'm hunting stuff and whatnot, unless it's the very first time I hit an area. And the protectors are the Grimalkins for this area. And yeah, his buddies basically shit their pants when a Baroth showed up, and we gotta go find them. But they are scared of us as well, and will run away if they see us. Yeah. And they are very, very radius detecting. So you have to be extremely careful. I don't believe they come back unless you leave the map if you miss one. I think they do come back after a bit of time if you leave the radius. Hmm. The good news is you can see them all on the map. So you know where you have to go to hunt them down. It would suck if you had to go all over the map for them. Bricks, you're an expert bug catcher, so... The idea of going slow and making sure you get the right opportunity, you're, you're pretty decent at these sort of things. It also helps, too, in a lot of these, I get a bit of a height advantage. They don't even see me coming for this guy. And one of the things you might have noticed there as soon as I started is Loki had an exclamation mark. Love that catch. That was well done. I didn't even know you could do it from up there. But uh, one of the things the Tail Riders taught him is that he can now talk to Jagris, mount them, and ride them around. Mm-hmm. Which is pretty good, if not for the fact that the Jagris don't attack you anymore. It's a little harder to farm components, but Jagris behave differently when you have one of your um, one of your Palicos mounting them. So it actually helps you if you're trying to farm them in a lot of cases. Especially because when you're farming them, you're probably going to jump back and forth to multiple different areas. And it quite helps, too, just having an extra hand on the field. If nothing else, a distraction for some monsters. Mm-hmm. As always, I'm impressed at your skill at catching these things. I got a lot of practice with the net. Some of the fishing we have to do later on when you have to, like, hook your net over an obstacle and land in an area gets pretty weird. I just stick to the fishing rod. Now, this guy is hiding out in a fantastic area. It is worth exploring here just for all the components you can pick up. Mandragoras, a lot of um, explosive components and whatnot for your bows and uh, guns. Great stuff down there. But we caught all the buddies, so time to go back. Ah. Landing on bones doesn't seem like a good idea. Yeah, you know what? Our legs are invincible. That's true. Just see some of the falls we'll take in later areas. Wiggle, wiggle. Wiggle, wiggle. Wiggle, wiggle. It's a good old kid and wiggle, except that they're not pouncing each other in a second, but... The heart of the protectors. This is an interesting item we get. It basically puts hate onto your palico friend, so that the monster will be attacking them instead of you. Mm -hmm. Your palico usually isn't too strong, but... If you're playing with a ranged weapon or such, having a distraction like that can be amazing. 
And these weapons, much like our earlier weapon, but in better ways, do have evolutions to them. So we'll be able to level those up with enough points, and once they hit a certain level, they'll actually get secondary functions we can use. And it won't just be like the little bubbles that you can choose to heal with versus the direct healing. They'll actually have different unique talents that they can use in battle. Very handy to level them up. Level all the weapons, because you may be surprised. One of my co-workers loves this game and plays a ton of it and didn't realize if you catch all those guys in every single area, we'll be able to get something very special later on. Mm -hmm. That'll be a bit down the line, but here's the other thing we got with the shield is that he can now ride Kestodon. Mm -hmm. Every area he'll get a tool and a new little thing he can ride. Pretty fantastic. And it's worth doing these, too, because all the doodles, even if you're not interested in changing up your palico equipment or using the riders, every single one of those doodles increases research points. And each of those tools can get leveled up to rank 10, so it's good to use them a lot until you're all done. <laughs> I quite like our room. But we'll be going and exploring the ravine next time. So I hope everyone joins me for that, and take care all.